Good morning, everyone. Uh, what a glorious day. I hope it's not too hot for you. Uh, I've just got one apology to make before I start the service, or before I ask Nick to start the service. I don't recognize a lot of you. Uh, now, that's either because you're new to the circuit or because my memory is getting worse. Uh, however, everyone is very, very welcome, and it's uh, going to be a glorious way of worshiping God together. So thank you for coming. Nick. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is really, really lovely to see you here today. This service has been uh, weeks and months uh, in the planning, uh, and it's so good uh, that the day has finally arrived. 
Um, it's a day that means a lot to a lot of people waking up in uh, England today, uh, but we know why we're here um, this morning. So welcome back, uh, everybody, uh, because this is the first time we've gathered as a circuit in real life. Uh, we've been gathering online, of course, uh, for 16 months or so now. And our huge thanks to everybody who's made um, those services uh, happen. Lovely to see you all. Please, uh, the motto for today is uh, enjoy yourselves, uh, relax and uh, worship together. Uh, wherever you are, um, uh, it's good to see you. You'll see uh, a sort of unofficial mosh pit has developed at the front here. Uh, if others would like to come and have a, a grandstand view there, please do come uh, if you can sit um, in, a, in a safe way. There's still people arriving. Uh, feel free as the service goes to, um, uh, to, to move around uh, in a safe way. Uh, coffee is being served right throughout the service. Um, you'll need to pay for that, uh, uh, but um, if ever you just feel a bit thirsty, um, do head over and, uh, and, and see Dan and enjoy the coffee. Okay, hopefully you've all received a, a service sheet um, for the day. That's as loud as it goes, if they want to hear, they've got to come forward. Okay, <laughs> I'm told this is as loud as it gets, so if you can't hear and you're standing too far away or sitting too far away, uh, do come closer. Um, uh, you've all got a service sheet for today. Uh, you can see the theme of the service is creation uh, and new creation. And we're going to be worshipping in all sorts of different ways uh, as we go through the morning together. Thanks uh, hugely to all our stewards today. You can see them in their high-vis jackets. If you want anything at any stage and you're uncertain, uh, please wave at one and they will help you, I am sure. Uh, please observe um, the one metre distance um, from people you haven't come with today, um, except in your bubbles. Um, we are operating in groups of 30, uh, and they are uh, identified by your coloured stickers that you are all wearing. So um, make sure you uh, uh, just keep an eye on people uh, and look out for people with the same colour. If you need the toilet at any stage, don't go in the bushes. <laughs> there are proper toilets in the rugby club uh, and uh, there will be a steward there to greet you uh, and tell you what to do. Um, we're hoping uh, that you don't need first aid today, but we do have a first aid officer, Tina, who's here to help if that happens. Uh, and uh, if you need help of that type, uh, over there in the green gazebo over there or just ask a steward um, to help you. Um, after the service uh, we are serving a delicious hog roast which is cooking even as we speak. That's available on a takeaway basis with an in-out scheme over here uh, and that's operating on a donation basis so um, uh, you can have it completely free if you feel like it but if you'd like to make a donation there'll be a pot for that but also uh, Peter Green should be around as well uh, to deal with um, your card payments. Okay, uh, just before we get going, some thank yous. Uh, huge thanks to Tim uh, and Marlow FM and Marlow TV, uh, to the AV team today who, make, uh, who are helping this to happen, for all the many who are taking part on and off stage uh, to the wonderful planning team. You know who they are. I've been working with me for weeks now. Um, and for the circuit for um, uh, paying for today's event. Marlow Rugby Club for welcoming us here and uh, uh, making us uh, welcome in this lovely um, open and safe space here. And finally, all of you, thanks to all of you for everything you've been doing during lockdown, the amazing things have been happening in your churches and in your communities through this time. Please, um, you, we're allowed to sing today, so please do sing and dance and worship in any way you like today. Um, our theme today, as I said, is creation, new creation, and to celebrate that, we're going to have our first song, Over All the Earth, You Reign on High. Every 
Okay, we're going to be continue to be led in worship now uh, with a medley from um, Samuel, who's recorded these songs specially for us. Um, it's uh, based on a song you'll know well, so do do join in. Samuel, you'll have seen in some of the online services, especially those uh, led by Vida.
Alléluia. Alléluia. Our thanks to Sam. Now, there aren't any Bible readings in our uh, service today, but we're going to have uh, some dramatic readings uh, taking us through the Bible story and ending with a certain person as a Methodist you may well recognize. Um, we've got three wonderful actors taking us through today, and we're going to start with Adam and Eve and a special welcome to God as well. Hello? Hello? Where are you? Hello? Yeah, yes, we're, we're, we're here, God. We're here. Adam? Eve? Are you hiding from me? Well, we heard your voice in the garden. But we were afraid, because we're naked. So we hid ourselves. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? Um... Um, uh, it was Eve. She, she was the one. She gave me the fruit. Uh, uh, all I did was eat it, so it's uh, not my fault. <laughs> not your fault. You ate the fruit of the tree I specifically told you not to eat in Chapter 2, before I even created Eve. Um, yes, yes. The one which I told you if you ate, you would surely die? Uh, yes but you're sure it's all her fault? Well, uh, maybe it was mostly her fault. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was mostly her fault. And what about you, Eve? What have you got to say for yourself? Well, you see, God, it was like this. There was this great big snake. Snake? Yes, a snake. And he said it was all right and we wouldn't actually die. So, having been commanded by God not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, all it takes is for a big snake to come along and tell you it's absolutely fine, you won't die after all. And you believe him, not me. Well, he was a very nice, oily snake. Quite a charmer, really. Oh, Eve. Adam. I gave you a choice. A big decision to make. Look around you. All this beauty is creation, made especially for you. This is my gift for you to explore and unravel its mysteries. I have done all of this for you. Sorry, Lord. No, I'm sorry. Sorry you did not see its sacredness. Respect its fragility or understand its complexity. And sorry, you exploit it and pollute it. You destroy wildlife habitat, burn rainforests, fill the oceans with plastic and engage in mass farming. You don't really worship me. You worship the God of greed and money. So now you must leave and go on a journey. Leave this beautiful garden? But it was just a piece of fruit. It was a piece of temptation. But is this journey going to be hard? Hard, painful and long for you and your descendants. You will invent murder, war, persecution, hatred and abuse. But for the sake of just one sinless descendant, a son of yours and mine, I will not abandon you. Well, well what, what will this son do? He will resist temptation. He will lead you like a shepherd to a new and pristine creation. He will crush the head of the, of the deceitful snake forever. But the snake will also strike him. Will the snake kill him? He will die to protect his sheep and continue to lead you. Now take off these robes and I will make proper clothes for you. It was a Methodist production. <laughs> Look, Lord, 
Couldn't we just stay and take a different test? M m maybe it's the best of three temptations. Sorry, the game's already gone to penalties. Now go! So the theme of temptation and creation. Beryl is going to lead us in some prayers of praise for creation. In your order of service, you will find the responses to the prayer. And when I say the words, we praise you, Lord, please will you respond with, we remember the goodness of God. We praise you, Lord. We remember the goodness of God. So let us pray. Creator God, in bright light and dull darkness, in the beauty of order brought out of chaos, in the energy of each day, and the rest that comes with night, we praise you, Lord. We remember the goodness of God. In the heavens high above our heads, in waters that run deep around the world, in the spirit that hovered over the waters of creation, we praise you, Lord. We remember the goodness of God. In solid land and flowing seas, in vivid flowers and fruit-laden trees, in your newness each morning and gentleness each evening, we praise you, Lord. We remember the goodness of God. In the rising and setting of the sun and the cycles of the seasons, in the patterns and mysteries of the shining stars, we praise you, Lord. We remember the goodness of God. In oceans teeming with fish, in skies filled with birds, in fields where animals graze and the joy of our pets, we praise you, Lord. We remember the goodness of God. In love and comfort of our families and friends, in all those we have lost and those we have gained, in our joy and our sorrows and our deepest selves as human beings, we praise you, Lord. We remember the goodness of God. And God looked and saw all that he had made. Indeed, it was very good. In rest and reflection, in wonder and worship, we praise you, Lord. We remember the goodness of God. In the name of the living Lord, who came and made his dwelling among us, freely sharing the beauty of his world, the free gift of life, we join in creation's song. Amen. Thank you so much, Beryl. We've got uh, a few glimpses of different uh, experiences of life over the last 16 months uh, in the service today. And I'm going to invite Grace to come forward first and uh, just reflect for a short time on what it's been like to be a student in lockdown. Grace. Brothers and sisters, good morning. Um, I'm Grace, John's daughter. Uh, I was asked to give testimony this morning on my experience over the last 12 months as a student while we've been living under COVID restrictions. It goes without saying that I've never before experienced any health crisis on the scale of last year. Since I was just halfway through my degree when the news of the outbreak was first reported, I paid less attention to it than I should have, presuming that nothing but the most extraordinary circumstances could possibly affect the next year and a half of my life, which of course I had thoroughly planned out. 
I came into this situation naive and underprepared. And when I had to go into isolation, along with many others in my university's College of Medicine, three weeks before the rest of the country went into national lockdown, cases were still low enough that I thought I'd be attending in-person exams that summer. Of course, none of those plans were to be, and I spent the next few months realizing that I wasn't nearly as invincible as I had been previously led to believe. By the end of that first summer, the death toll was rising. I had broken up with my partner at the time and my lifelong best friend had just lost her grandfather because of the pandemic. All of my amazing plans were going out the window one by one. These times in our lives always seem to change the landscape of our faith in God. Last Christmas, my parents were diagnosed with COVID. I felt especially lonely living with one friend at my university and unable to see my parents who were in isolation. In Isaiah, it says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great life, a uh, great light. <laughs> and I really understood and felt that last Christmas. It can be very hard to have hope during the times when storms seem to knock our lives right off course. I'm sure many of you have also had mixed feelings over the last couple of months as we talk about lifting restrictions and as we look around ourselves, not recognizing our own lives. Changes in freedom seem to be starting to take place all around us, including the most recent decision in the Methodist Church to allow same-sex marriage. All these things are signs that the world is changing in big ways at the moment. My hope for all of us here today is that we fully enjoy the opportunity to meet with those from our church circuit as the big church family we represent, and that our ability to once again meet in person will fill us all with great hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. That was wonderful. Well, our drama team are back now. God is back. Um, and it looks as though the weather's changing. Can you see it? There's a top of a mountain poking out of the water. Are you sure, no? What happened to that dove you sent out? The one that brought back the nice green olive branch? Well, I sent it out again this morning and, and, and nothing. Never came back. Oh, well, at least this beastly rain has stopped and finally we can let all those animals go. Especially the awful snakes. Do you know, I, I quite like having all the animals. Now, you really are winding me up, Noah. Those animals, the cacophony of noise wasn't enough. The smell! Oh! It was absolutely awful. Three weeks at sea is terrible, absolutely appalling. Actually, I'm not sure we smell too good after all these weeks at sea either. Well, maybe we would smell a bit better if the crocodiles and alligators hadn't taken up our bathtub. Why did we have to bring them all anyway? I told you, it's God's will. Now listen, you know, just saying that everything is God's will is not actually the answer. Oh gosh, look at that pretty rainbow over there. What's God trying to tell us now, I wonder? I'm not sure. Perhaps it's a sign. Yes, of course it's a sign. How much bigger can a sign get? Hello, God. The journey's going well. Mr and Mrs Noah, don't you like my sign? Oh, it's absolutely beautiful. But what's it a sign of? This is my rainbow of hope. A rainbow of hope? Yes, hope for the future. Hope for well, all well-being. And the NHS, of course. So what should we hope for? Look. Things haven't gone too well since your ancestors, Adam and Eve, left the Garden of Eden. 
And now the whole of creation has got mixed up in it. But I have always had a plan to lead you away from the past into a brighter future. And we should put our hope into this brighter future? Exactly, Mrs. Noah. You really are quite the theologian. Salvation is about healing and saving. It's about one person and then a small group of people and then a larger community coming together in love in to cooperatively save everything. Not just the people, but all of creation. It's about making all things new. And I expect you and all of you, all of you, to play your part. Does that mean we're going to have to build another ark? Uh, no, Noah. You've already done that and done it very well. So today I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of chaos. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So we can leave the ark behind and be really fruitful and multiply. <laughs> yes, you can. From this covenant of hope, I will create a covenant people and set you all on the road to salvation. Hooray! 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 Hooray. But Lord, but Lord, now we're leaving it, what are we going to do with this ark? Oh, don't worry, Noah. In a few thousand years, I'll turn it into a cafe in Marlow. Uh, very good. We're going to have uh, a couple of reflections now. The first one is recorded by Clive, who's away on holiday enjoying creation somewhere else. But he's recorded this specially for us um, uh, with uh, Downley, the experience of Downley Church, just a little picture for us. And then Georgina's going to be sharing with us. Georgina, you want to, if you want to come round, I think, by the time, because um, Clive's piece is only really very, very short. Greetings from Sunnybank. I'm sorry not to be able to be with you in person today, but I hope it's all going well. The restrictions obviously caused us much disruption, but Zoom worked well, and a telephone chain kept us all in contact and seemed to be well received, especially by the less mobile folk in our congregation. Our wonderful organist, Ed, felt frustrated at not being with us and asked if he could come and play live music for an hour on Sundays. We agreed, of course, and took the opportunity to open the church doors and let his music waft out over Downley Common, at the same time allowing people to come in for private prayer, and we were able to put some images on the screen to help with meditation. It felt like a static ghetto blaster, and passing walkers couldn't fail to notice that they were near a church. The other thing which we were able to do with assistance from the circuit was to get an internet connection installed in the chapel. This will be a terrific help in allowing us to tackle a higher number of local arrangements this quarter and stream services from Wesley and Marlow. We're planning to continue to meet at our usual time of 10, but to serve tea and coffee whilst waiting to watch the online service at 10.30. Oh, I forgot to say that although we're still not allowed to sing, Sunnybank folk have become extremely good at loud humming. Enjoy the day.
This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Saviour all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Saviour all the day long. I know Clive is not here, but Clive, thank you for that. Ministry in the pandemic. Now the word ministry is very often associated with roles related to the church, but that is too narrow. Ministry also refers to what God calls every one of us to do living and working in various ways and in different situations for God. As Christians, whatever we think, say and do forms part of our ministry in and to God. In the next five or so minutes, I'll be sharing a little of an experience I had during the pandemic which has transformed my ministry greatly. I must say this before I start. The testimony is of my experience when I was called to an ICU ward to stand in the gap for a family I am close to. As they said their farewells to their husband and father. I am mindful of the fact that some of us have been recently bereaved. I pray that we are encouraged, strengthened, and enriched in our ministries through the little I share. Our close friend Paul was taken into hospital with COVID and we had been praying fervently day and night. On the 2nd of March, 2020, a week after his admission, I got a call from the family asking if I would accompany the oldest son to the hospital for the life support machines to be switched off. The rest of the family would join via video call. The whole family, except the oldest, had come down with the virus. I think what decided me was Josephine, the wife, saying, we have no one else. At least if auntie goes, she will be able to pray with him. I felt no anxiety at that point, and I was not afraid. In ministry, brothers and sisters, God sometimes calls and sends us to unexpected places and to situations we cannot comprehend. Ours is just to go. Because there had been COVID in the family, the oldest son was sent back home, unable to be with his father. That for me was confirmation that God had sent me there. It was while I waited for the consultant to set up that I encountered what I described after the event as my Jonah moment. One of the administrators came up to me and attempted to persuade me not to go in. He stressed how dangerous it was, explained how medical professionals were being infected and said categorically that I must go back home. Friends, that conversation filled me with such fear that I almost abandoned ship. I clutched onto my bag and I was ready to walk out. You see, God strengthens and equips us 
when he calls and sends us. At that point, I knew that I could only put my trust in God and God alone. In Paul's room in the ICU, we faced another huge challenge. The video call wouldn't work. So on the consultant's advice, I spoke to Paul in what was his last few moments with us, while the consultant and the ICU nurse moved heaven and earth to get it to work. It took four tries for the connection to go through. And the consultant's perseverance in getting it to work convinced me that God had placed him there for such a time as that. As we engage in ministry, God places people in situations and works through them to support and bless us. Brothers and sisters, ministry can be challenging. I was challenged through my experience that day. But ministry is undoubtedly transforming. The whole experience transformed my thinking and understanding of the way God seeks to use us in his service and has transformed and deepened my understanding of the truth of Jesus' victory over death. May we continue to encounter the transforming power of Christ as we do ministry trusting in God daily. Amen. Thank you, Georgina, for those very moving words. We're going to have a, a time of reflection now as Tracy uh, plays for us. V delighted to welcome Tracy to play the keyboard for a piece, Starry Dome, which also has a resonance for our next drama, which will follow with Abram and Sarai.
Abraham. Look at the stars tonight. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> Sorry, my lovely wife. The sky is so immense. The stars are impossible to count. On nights like this, I think of all the adventures we've had over the years, all the scrapes we've been through together since we left Ur. But, you know... Yes, sorry, I, I, I know. We always wanted children, didn't we? But you can't say God hasn't been kind and merciful to us. <laughs> you could have been a queen in Egypt. You think I could have married anyone, even a pharaoh who wears an ugly snake around his head? Oh, oh. I, I'm, I'm glad you didn't, but it, but it would have been nice to have some... Children? <laughs> really? You two do need to stop feeling sorry for yourselves. Look! Look at all this beauty! God, it, it is beautiful, but you have led us here. But have, why have you led us here? Haven't I already told you that I will make you all into a mighty nation and I will bless you? I will make your name great, so that all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Yes, God, you did, but... Well, here all around you is the land of Canaan. This is that promised land that I will give to your descendants. Yes, but I am old and I have no descendants. And frankly, I'm no spring chicken at 90 either. You both have been faithful to me all these years. And so I will bless you with children. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Do you think it's too difficult for me? Maybe not for you, God, but somewhat difficult for me. Right! Enough! I am the one true God, and I will keep my promises. And just as I did with your ancestor Noah... I will establish my covenant with you to be your God and I will multiply you exceedingly and I will be their God. So on your knees. Do you see the night sky? Just as numerous as the stars are, so your offspring shall be. Rise, Abraham. No longer will you be called Abraham, but Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations, and many kings will descend from you. You too, arise, Sarai. You are now Sarah, for I will bless you and surely give you a child. And you will be the mother of nations. Ruler, rulers of people will descend from you. Now, smarten up you two and stop feeling sorry for yourselves. In a year, at the appointed time, I will return to you. And by then, you will already have a laughing boy called Isaac. Yes, God. Yes, God. That's better. Right. Abraham, here you are. Um, now then, get on with that lot. What's this? Nappies, blankets, baby clothes, paintbrush. It's a shopping list, mm. darling. Now, on your bike. We need to totally do up the nursery and we don't have much time. Oh, and by the way, can you bring me back some nice sugary treats? I'm really very hungry all of a sudden. It's our chance to sing now uh, from the service sheets, Deep in the Shadows of the Past. Shadows of the past, far out from settled. 
What magnificent words. Deep in the shadows of the past. Leaders long ago who copied, sifted, and preserved the Bible that we know. We give thanks to God for that Bible. We think and give thanks to God for those past generations who have sustained and made sure that the Bible is available to us today, immutable, unchangeable. And so as we come to our prayers of confession, we too have looked back in time and borrowed from previous scripts words and prayers that are so ancient you would wonder whether they are relevant today. We have taken contemporary prayers from modern people and put them together and John has selected this so that we can celebrate whether old or new the words appealing to God to give us forgiveness because we, like previous generations, need forgiveness. So as we pray together in our confessions, at some points I'm going to say, forgive us our trespasses. Would you please reply as we forgive those who trespass against us? I would say, Father, forgive us our trespasses and you will respond as we forgive those who trespass against us. So let us pray. Forgiving God, when we consider your awesome works, we know we have sinned. How can a mortal be righteous before you? You laid the earth's foundations. You fixed the limits for the sea. You give orders to the morning. You tip over the water jars of the heavens. You raise the dead to new life. You can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. So we humble ourselves before you and acknowledge, amongst other things, our unwillingness to feel the suffering of others and our readiness to live comfortably with injustice. Father, forgive us our trespasses. For our self-righteousness that denies guilt. For our self-interest that strangles compassion. Father, forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive. For our abuse of this planet and our exploitation of its resources. Father, forgive us our trespasses. For our failings in community and our reticence to become involved. Father, forgive us our trespasses. For the times we are too eager to be better than others, when we are too rushed to care, 
when we are when we are too tired to bother or when we are too preoccupied to listen when we are too quick to act out of motives other than love father forgive us our trespasses we have done things we do not understand and failed to do your will therefore we repent in dust and ashes may God forgive us Christ renew us and the Spirit enable us to grow in love fear not said the Lord for I have redeemed you I have summoned you by name you are mine amen Hello everyone. I'm part of the planning committee, but I didn't mean to take any part of the service. Whilst we were talking about uh, transformation, I brought out this from my shelf, and I thought Vicky would rather make good use of it. And then I was lumbered with it. But here am I. Before all you lovely people who could otherwise have been in your beds with cups of tea or coffee, but haven't been recreated by God, transformed already, you decided to give him all the praise and worship, and here you are, worshiping together. What a family. Let us pray. Loving God, bless now the words of my mouth, and the meditation of our hearts. Breathe your spirit into us and grant that we may hear your word and in hearing be led in the way you want us to be and want us to go. Amen. Thinking about the word transformation, I thought, what a good example to use butterflies. I tried to wear a Ghanaian attire, which will be big and overflowing, but of course I won't be able to walk in it, so I downed it and tried this instead, something colorful to go with the, the butterfly uh, scheme that I'll be talking about. Butterflies, as we all know, have brightly colored wings, so lovely to look at. As they grow, they undergo transformation, a process known as metamorphosis. We get the word metamorphosis, or metamorphosis from the Greek word metamorpho, a change from the inside out, like when a butterfly, a caterpillar, becomes a butterfly. We all know the story, but just a recap for the young ones here. First, the female butterfly lays eggs, and inside the tiny eggs, caterpillars like this. And I'm, I'm asking Neil to help me because I'm very short. Thank you. Caterpillars um, like these grow. When the caterpillar is fully grown, it becomes a pupa or chrysalis, a kind of case in which the caterpillar ready to is ready, gets ready to change into a butterfly. Finally, the case around the pupa splits open and out comes the butterfly. Got to turn it inside out, yes. No, I am not. I can't fly. You have to turn it inside. The head is still in there. <laughs> By 
by the way, cannot fly straight away as the wings are uh, at first wet and wrinkled against its body. It waits until they are dry and then it flies away. I'm using a caterpillar as an illustration today because of its transformation process to become a butterfly. And the scripture text that comes to mind is Romans 12 verse two. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, do not copy the behavior and customs of this 21st century world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We Christians know that it is the word of God that transforms us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual transformation is both intentional on our part and the result of the work of the Holy Spirit. And what is God's desire? His desire is that we would be transformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. But sometimes we can be negatively conformed, that is, changed by the world in the wrong ways perhaps by the friends that we hang around with, the shows that we watch, the games we play, or by what we listen to or read. But as children of God, we should be looking for transformation opportunities, as transformation is an intentional initiation initiation on our part that is associated with the Holy Spirit. Living a transformed life is a very satisfying experience as we follow Christ through humility, a study of his word. He then transforms our minds, our desires, our wills, our relationships, and our ultimate reason for living, and then help bring others to Christ. Once transformed, we will certainly begin to multiply and make more disciples, make more followers of Christ, both in our local contests and across the world. But Paul says, Having been transformed by God's word through the Holy Spirit, we become new persons, new creation. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, the old life is gone and a new life has begun. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So brothers and sisters in Christ, as we are gathered here this morning, our Lord Jesus Christ invites us to experience a new and transformed life with him through the Holy Spirit. As we seek God, may he transform our lives and so impact our communities through us. In his name we pray. Amen. As I started coming, a song that was burning in my heart is something that you all know, and we'll all sing together the first verse. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a full taste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. One of his spirit was in his blood. Yes. This is my story. This is my song. Praise my Savior, Lord and Lord. This is my story. This is my song.
is my song. Thank you, Vida. And Neil. And the butterfly, <laughs> which emerged eventually. <laughs> Our next drama now, uh, we move on to the story of Moses and the lesser known Zipporah. Moses, how was work today? Never mind, Zipporah. I've had a vision. But hang on, what, what happened to your shoes? Well... You had a vision, but but I would say it's a touch of the sun, more likely. It, I told you to cover up and wear sunscreen factor 50. It, it's, it's not me who was burning. There was this bush on fire. Well, I hope you stayed well clear. No, I, I went over to it. Oh, dear. It was totally on fire, but it, it wasn't being burned up. I see. And the fire singed your shoes? No. The bush told me to take them off. The bush told you to take off your shoes? Yes. It, it, it said... Moses! Moses! Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. One, two. And... And did this talking tree have a name? I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It was God. I am who I am. And what did he is who he is want? I have seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I have come down to rescue them and to bring them up out of Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, that's all very good, important work, but what did God want with you, Moses? Therefore, go, Moses. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Look, it, it's all quite simple. God wants me to go and stand up to the all-powerful Pharaoh and say to him, let my people go. Start ten different plagues, bring the Israelites out of Egypt, part the waters of the Red Sea to escape the pursuing army, clout my Sinai and break down the covenant law on two slabs of stone, break the slabs of stone into pieces, go up the mountain and do the same thing all over again, put the stone slabs in a box and wander around the desert with it for 40 years and then die right at the edge of the promised land before I can go into Canaan and occupy it. Oh, well, that's fine then. Can, can I go? No, of course not. Where's your army, Moses? Well, I have my brother Aaron and this stick. God's given you a stick to beat the Egyptians? Uh, well, well, yes. If you throw it on the ground, it turns into a snake. Oh, not snakes. I hate snakes. Yeah, it's, no, no, no. It's a good snake. It eats other snakes. It's, well, it, it's complicated. It certainly is. So you, Aaron, and a stick are going to allow, off now to free the whole of the Israelites and lead them to the promised land? Exactly. But Moses, do you really think one person can save the whole world? Well, we're just leading the Israelites to Canaan. But if you're asking, can one person actually save the whole world, then I had another vision also. One where the snake gets lifted up on high in the stick. And the answer is yes. Yes, I do believe that there is one person, but only one person, who can really save the whole world. Right, you lot, you've done enough sitting and listening. You've now got to do some work. And I'm really sorry that not everybody managed to get a piece of paper. Um, you could use your order of service, but don't tell anybody I said that. I have here a very big 
piece of paper so that you can see what I am doing. I'm going to ask Graham to come and help me because, because he's my husband, we can get within a meter of each other. And we're going to attempt to transform our big piece of paper into a butterfly. Now, before I do any folding, in origami, you need to know that a mountain fold is when the fold is pointing up and the paper is pointing down. So, starting with your square piece of paper, and if you're using your order of service, you're going to need to do that trick where you turn it into a square. I can see Pam's already got it sussed. And the first thing you're going to do is take your square and make a mountain fold diagonally to turn it into a triangle. Voila! I can see some triangles. And then you need to unfold it and fold it into a triangle the opposite way. Voila! Excellent. Oh, come on, wind. Please cooperate. You then need to open up your piece of paper and turn it over. Graham and I have had lots of practice folding sheets together. Right. You're now having turned it over so that the folds you've just made are now valley folds pointing down. You need to fold your paper in half to make a rectangle this time. So, I'll, okay, we'll do it that way. Now we're doing it. Voila. Excellent. And then you unfold it. You turn it and you make another rectangle. We haven't argued yet. <laughs> Excellent. Now, the next bit is going to be the most complicated bit, but watch what we do first, and then you'll get it set. You need to open up your paper Stop, 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 stop. And you knead it so that your diagonal folds are mountains and your horizontal folds are valleys. And you're going to find the middle of your square. This is what we did at home. And you are going to fold, please calm down, wind. Your diagonals out. And at the same time, push the sides in. I'm going to use my foot. Okay, so I've done my side. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you're doing a brilliant job, you lot. It needs to be a triangle, not a diamond. So it's the sides that you need to push in. Well done, Pam. Yeah, well done. I can see some fantastic ones. <laughs> right, you take that side. I'll come round and then you might be able to see a bit better. So there's my diagonal, that side. Voila. There's my diagonal, that side. And using my foot, I'm pushing the side in and it looks like the roof of a house. Okay? Right, now we're gonna make, we're transforming this piece of paper into a butterfly. We're now going to make the wings. So, point up, 
flat bit to the bottom. Apologies for the people that are still. <laughs> Neil, bring together two diagonals and push the side in. That's it. Right. Top layer. I'm going to bring the corner to the top, not all the way to the middle. I want a bit poking out. I'm getting there. I'm winning. Right, can you do the same your side? <laughs> and then you do the same the other side. Bring the top layer up. So it's poking out a little way. Is that making sense? If you go all the way to the middle, you won't have the top of your butterfly wings. That looks good, Sue. I'm liking the look of that. Brilliant. Now, you need to turn it over. <laughs> and then, this pointy bit at the bottom you need to bring up. Hang on a minute, because I'm losing. You might have to put it on the floor for this bit. Hang on, you need to. Oh. oh. Right, can you do that the other side, please, love? No, just the top layer. Apologies, newspaper's not very sturdy. Right, flip it over. Oh. Right, we're gonna lift that up like that so that it comes over the pops over the top a bit. It's gonna curl, it's meant to curl. Right, ready to pick it up? Right. We have lifted the bottom corner, bottom point so that it comes above the top. And these are meant to curl, because now you can see they look like wings. And to secure it all in place, you fold it down. You fold it in half. And there, is your butterfly. It needs to come higher up. You've got the right idea, James, but the triangle, if you can see, the triangle needs to poke over the top of the, but the butterfly so that you can fold it down to make the head secure everything. <laughs> I'll give you lessons over the hog roast. You've also got, oh, well done, Tina. <laughs> Excellent. Nigel, yours is nearly there. Nearly. You've got a whole song to practice now because we're going to sing Colours of Dawn. of day dawn into the mind the sun has come up the night is behind go down in the city into the street and let's give the message to the people we meet so light up the fire and let the flame burn open the door let jesus return take seeds of his spirit let his fruit grow Tell the people of Jesus Let his love show Go through the park On into the town The sun 
sun still shines on, it never goes down. The light of the world is risen again. The people of darkness are needing a friend. So light up the fire and let the flame burn. Open the door, let Jesus return. Take seeds of his spirit, let his fruit grow. Tell the people of Jesus, let his love show. The darkness has come, the sun came to die The evening draws on, the sun disappears But Jesus is living, His Spirit is near So light up the fire and let the flame burn Open the door, let Jesus return Take seeds of His Spirit, let His fruit grow Tell the people of Jesus, let his love show. So light up the fire and let the flame burn. Open the door, let Jesus return. Take seeds of his spirit, let his fruit grow. Tell the people of Jesus, let his love show. Okay, so the other thing that I handed to you as you arrived this morning was a packet of seeds. And if I missed anybody, there are still some left. Find me at the end. Don't worry, what I'm going to ask you to do with these is nowhere near as challenging as transforming a piece of paper into a butterfly. Seeds are funny little things. When you look at them, they look wizened and dry and not much promise in them. But you plant them and they stay underground for a while and you're not quite sure what's going on and then miraculously out comes sign of new life and the world is a better place for the beautiful things that come out of seeds and as we're thinking about new life and creation and when we were planning for the service i came across the picture that if you are technology savvy inclined, you can find by scanning the QR code. And it's a picture of how some kindergarten children took some seeds and sowed them in a very unlikely landscape and the outcome of that. And our challenge to you is to take these seeds and plant them somewhere. And actually, just this morning, whilst I was waiting for you all to arrive, I spotted a family where the little girl had her very own little litter picker and was picking up bits of rubbish very proudly and encouraged by her parents. And I was so touched by it, I asked her mum and dad if I could give her a packet of seeds, which they were very grateful to receive, and said, as you're managing to change, transform the area by picking up the litter, maybe you could transform it even more by planting some of these seeds, which they seemed to like the idea of. And that family, they were, um, Hannah and Simon were the parents. Daisy was the little girl, how apt that she should have a, a flower name. And she had her little brothers, Wilbur and Freddie, with her. So go and transform somewhere with your seeds. And who knows what seeds we have been planting as we have talked about our faith and shared our faith with friends, with family, with work colleagues over the years, the months, the weeks. And who knows what harvest they will bring. Thank you, Vicky, and uh, do enjoy sowing these seeds and uh, seeing what comes. The wilderness will blossom like a rose. It will bloom and rejoice with joy and singing. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor 
of our God. That's the last piece of the Old Testament from this service. We move into the new now with our wonderful drama team. John the Baptist and a man and a woman. Listen to the words of the prophet. I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. For all humanity shall see God's salvation. What's he saying? Come with me, all of you. For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Repent. Confess your transgressions, and I, John, will baptize you with water for the forgiveness of your sins. Come, one and all. So, sorry, why should we be baptized? Where is the Israelites? <clears throat> We're already the chosen people. Do not presume to say we Israelites have Abraham as our father. For the axe lies ready, and every tree that does not produce good fruit shall be cut down and thrown into the fire. You cannot escape the coming of wrath, you brood of vipers. Vipers, snakes, I hate them! You must produce fruit in keeping with repentance. How do we produce this fruit? Whoever has two tunics should share with the person who has none. And whoever has food must do the same. But if you can forgive sins, then you must be our long-promised Messiah, the Christ. I am not the Christ. Well, you must be Elijah. I am not. So are you a prophet? No. Then why do you baptize? I baptize with water. But one more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So... You are not the Christ, but the Christ is coming and will soon be here. He comes after me. Sorry, the, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Well, which is it? Christ came before you or is Christ coming after you? Listen, in the Garden of Eden, God promised Eve her descendant would come to crush the head of the snake to remake creation in all its fullness of life. Even though he is her descendant, he was with God in the beginning. He was the word, and he was the word God spoke at creation. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Through him, all things are made. And through him, all things will be made new again even creation itself. In him, all life and the light that comes here, here so that it might be revealed to Israel. Because the word has become flesh and made his dwelling among us, among us. I come as a witness and I testify to the light so that you might too see the light and believe. So all we have to do is come with you. Come, see his glory. The glory of the one and only, the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right. I would like to see this light that, that will make all creation new again. Quickly, for he comes, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Come and see God speak and his Holy Spirit de descend upon him. Like a dove, quick. And they were gone. We planned this service uh, with so many wonderful things in it um, to finish a few minutes ago, and there's still a bit to go. So I'm making an executive decision that I'm not going to share my piece now, uh, but I will put it in an online service soon. Um, but uh, Richard is going to come now and uh, share with us a very short meditation. I want you to imagine that in your hands you have a box of free-range eggs. 
a box of free range eggs. A shopping bag full, I realized that I'd forgotten to buy some eggs. And after purchasing my box of six free range eggs, I thought maybe if I arranged my shopping bag, they may fit. No, they didn't. I decided to carry my box of free range eggs in my hand. Over one shoulder, my full shopping bag, and in my hand, my box of free range eggs. I knew my route home. I was walking my daily exercise. What obstacles would there be on my journey where my box of free range eggs, eggs could topple out of my hand and smash? Would I be startled by someone jogging or cycling or rushing, wanting to pass me by on my walk up Amersham Hill? Anxiety filled my mind for a moment, but it passed. Anxiety and depression may have filled your minds and souls over this pandemic time. Holding this box of six free-range eggs reminded me that we are held by God in our frailty, in our fragility, as we navigate through life, and that we need to hold fast to God and his promises. As we listen to these few words of scripture may come to mind, or hymns or choruses that remind us that we are held in God's loving hands from cradle to grave and beyond. We need not fear. The box of six free range eggs arrived home intact. They don't always, but on this occasion, they did. Our sister Angela, in conversation on Friday, was telling me that she nearly fell in a new cafe in High Wycombe, and as she was about to topple over, a hand reached out and held her. And that kind gentleman bought her dinner too, paid for her dinner. What a wonderful story of how God watches over us and holds us. Best before and used by printed on my box of six free range eggs has always puzzled me. And God wants to use us in our frailty for his purposes in our fragility. We're never too old and never too young. Never say never, my mother says, but I suspect otherwise mothers say that too. Life is full of puzzles and some of us have discovered jigsaw puzzles and thank God for the wisdom of scientists in producing a vaccine. Thank God for my box of six free-range eggs and the hens that produced them that cause me to meditate on his love and that I am held, that we are held in his love. This prayer came from my daily readings yesterday by Michael Jakeser. Spirit who gives us breath Hold and shape us so that we can reflect the love of God and the compassion of Christ. Open our minds and hearts to imagine new possibilities that draw us away from apathy or selfishness and comfortable corners to walk your way of full life for all. Amen. Thank you, Richard. As we move towards uh, the end of our service now, or the final part, uh, we're going to sing, I Am a New Creation. I am a new creation. My heart is 
Good morning, and I hope you are really getting into this extended time of uh, praise and witness. I'm told that Dan, the coffee man, is going to be going at about half past, so you've got 15 minutes to get yourself a last uh, brew. Now, for around 18 months, uh, we've been locked down in the midst of the storm of this COVID-19 pandemic, and it swept the world. And it might be easy for us to ask, as the disciples once did, where is Jesus during this storm while our boat is being tossed so viciously about? Is God asleep in the stern while we have to face the heaving seas and the terrifying winds alone? But of course, as you've heard this morning from all sorts of eloquent testimonies, right through this health crisis, Jesus has been active, very active in A&E departments and intensive care riding in ambulances and with the emergency services, in businesses struggling economically with all those on furlough or who have lost their jobs altogether, in people's houses, especially as they isolate, in care homes where the crisis has been at its worst, and not just in Britain, not just in the developed countries, but throughout the world, wherever there are sick who need healing, wherever there are people who are vulnerable, wherever there are poor who do not know where their next meal is coming from, or homeless without a roof over their heads, or refugees fleeing their homeland, or people grieving, people in fear, people anxious in pain or suffering, or all alone. Jesus has always been with us in this pandemic, and step by step, Jesus is carrying us through. And we are so grateful to God for the dedicated staff of the NHS for volunteers, for the gift of safe and effective vaccines developed in an incredibly short period of time and for all the other very special ways in which Christ through the Holy Spirit has just kept on carrying us that our speakers have borne witness to this morning. But I want to talk about another existential threat in which Jesus is also the central figure of salvation and where he again bears the burden of leading us safely through together. And this is an even greater cosmic crisis of epic proportions that has been brewing since the dawn of time. Because our theme today is one of creation and new creation. In the first book of the Bible, Genesis, we're told the story of the first creation, a story of failure that will not be entirely resolved until the very last book, Revelation. 
Genesis tells us how carefully and meticulously God lays out the earth, how he plants a garden and fills it with everything green and abundant, how he populates it with living things and introduces birds and fish and animals and eventually people. And we are told that God looks at this pristine and beautiful creation and it is very good. And if we look around ourselves today, especially in a lovely place like Marlow, down by the river, we can still see glimpses of that first perfect creation. But let's not fool ourselves by just looking locally, as so many people do. We have damaged this creation in all sorts of terrible ways. We have been busy blighting the environment for generations without care or respect for the very earth God entrusted to our care. Even as I speak to you this morning, there are fires blazing in the Amazon rainforest where tribes live for whom the forest is their only home, where the lungs of the world are being cut down to create farmland for cheap commercial gain, while governments turn a blind eye. Even as I speak to you today, there are viable grasslands that are turning into acres of desert, producing famines for many hundreds of thousands of people. Temperatures are globally soaring. And in Australia, for example, huge areas of the Great Barrier Reef, a natural wonder of the world, are suffering from coral bleaching and death. Sea levels and coastlines are threatened. Wildlife habitats are disappearing. Biodiversity is suffering. In short, in the same way as we shut ourselves off from God's love and God's life, when we indulge in our own sinful temptations and desires, so we collectively, through our own actions, inaction and greed, are strangling the life from God's good creation. Christ is not just for us individually. As Methodists, we believe that Christ died for all. But today we are remembering that Christ also died for all creation because Christ makes all things new. And that story is told in the Bible and is written through each of our biblical dramas that Jackie and David and Lawrence are so wonderfully performing for us this morning. So let me quickly summarize for you the big picture and tell you how God plans to bring a new creation out of the mess we have made of the first one. And it's important that you know because you are an integral and vital part of the plan with an invaluable role to play. First, God created the cosmos and everything in it in all its richness and beauty. And then God created humankind with the specific instruction to protect and look after and steward creation. But as in so many things, we messed it up. Even so, God made a covenant with Noah to try a different approach. So God chose a specific people, a special people whose job was to live in harmony with God and in harmony with God's creation. God brought his chosen people out of slavery, gave them rules and settled them in their own promised land, flowing with milk and honey. They had every advantage just as today. We have every advantage, but they failed to observe the law that God gave them and once more things got messed up. God sent the prophets, but to no avail. So God decided to send his son, his only son, the word who was with God in the beginning, the word who was God himself. God poured himself into frail human flesh and became Jesus, the very sacrifice by which, through the resurrection, he pivots everything around. From creation, we have humanity. From humanity, we have a chosen people. From the chosen people, we have the prophetic witness and the Lord, their God, who for our sakes becomes Jesus. So that the new creation can begin in this way. Jesus calls the disciples the apostolic witness to replace the old prophetic witness. Through the apostles at Pentecost, he calls the church a new chosen people whose promised land is the new Jerusalem in the new creation. And these new chosen people called Christians, us, 
each one of us are sent out throughout the world to be salt and light to all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so from this new chosen people made up of all nationalities, all races, all skin colors, all social classes, all genders, from God's universal church, the gospel message, the new creation message is to be spread to all people and all people are to become stewards of the new creation. That is how we save this precious planet and we, you and I, unworthy as we are, are the ones appointed to do it. It is our job, our mission, if you will, to take God's healing message of grace, the message of salvation as it has been taught to us in Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit to keep making a nuisance of ourselves until we influence all nations and all peoples, not just to live in peace together, but to live in peace with God and creation. It is our job to ensure that out of this chaos will rise the new creation, a new creation of which we already carry the seeds inside ourselves, just like the seeds which Vicky spoke about planted into cracks in the pavement. So at this very moment, Christ stands patiently knocking on our stone-cold hearts, breaking them apart bit by bit, until in the tiny cracks he can plant the seeds of the tree of life that will take root in whatever fertile ground it finds. And it is through grace, it is through piety, it is through service, it is through prayer that our hearts will be transformed into that fertile ground, into a warm, living, moving and loving heart that beats in time to the rhythm of the whole of God's good creation. And that is how Christ will build the new creation from the inside out, one contrite and humble heart at a time. Amen. Priscilla, another letter from Paul. Oh, my goodness. Is it another wonderful essay on love or the Last Supper or the Resurrection, perhaps? Well, let's see. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's very nice, but, but skip a bit, Aquila. Look, this is about Abraham. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Oh, that's, that's easy. The Spirit comes with faith, not works or the law. But what's, what's that got to do with you, Abraham? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Those who have faith are therefore sons and daughters of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and foretold the gospel to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. You know, Priscilla, I think what Paul is telling us is that because Abraham came before Moses brought the law from Mount Sinai, he must have been saved by faith. Just, just as we Gentiles who don't have the law have been given the holy faith Holy Spirit, by faith. Yes, uh, don't you see? Paul is saying that when God promised Abraham and Sarah that they would be father and mother of many nations, they meant nations of faith also. You are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave, nor free, male, nor female. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. And if you belong 
to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So all the promises given to Abraham and Moses and even Adam and Eve the promise of salvation and the Easter hope of resurrection apply equally to all. Everyone is included in God's plan to save and give new life, not just to specific individuals, but to the whole of creation as well. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. You know what that means? What? Paul is saying that we are not just living in the spirit, we are already living in the new creation. Because of our faith, we have the spirit in us. And because we have the spirit, we have the new creation in us. We are the new creation, Priscilla, in which God is reconciling the whole world to himself in Christ. Yes, but there's even more than that. Even more? Yes, look, God is reconciling the world to himself, but he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Don't you see? We are God's messengers through whom the world is to be reconciled. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. It all makes sense now. Our role is to become ambassadors for Christ, ambassadors to the world of God's righteousness. You might say ambassadors of the new creation. Amen. Gracious God, your amazing love extends through time and space to all parts of your creation which you created and called good. Your covenant with the human family is remembered in every rainbow in the sky, symbolising your promise of love and blessing to every living creature and to all successive generations. In Jesus, you invite us to enter into a new covenant in communion with all who seek to be faithful to you and to do justice. As people of faith, we are called into covenant. Your covenant of faithfulness and love extends to the whole creation. So today, we pray for the healing of our planet, that present and future generations may enjoy the fruits of creation and continue to glorify and praise you. So Lord, we pray. Father God, we pray for the nations and for our politicians and our leaders we ask that you cause them to act in the best interest of all peoples today and all peoples in the future. Today, we pray for the people of Haiti following the assassination of their presidents. We pray that you will raise up a new leader who will cherish their people and offer them justice and guidance. We pray also for the leaders of the northern states of America and Canada and South America as they face the prospect of record high temperatures and the subsequent dangers to all. Be with them, Lord, as they make life and death decisions. For the future, Lord, we ask you to raise up a generation of leaders who will be willing to act justly 
so that those who have contributed so little to the problems we are facing and have fewer resources with which to face it are not left to shoulder our burden. We ask for you to fill the hearts of all who lead wealthy nations like ours, to give generously to poor countries and poor communities so that all may share in your generosity and mercy. Mother God, you have called us to be keepers of your earth. We have learned so much over the last year about alternative ways of living, lifestyles more in tune with your planet. We pray, Lord, that the lessons learned will not be forgotten. We pray that you may establish an economy that supports the web of life. May we learn to live sustainably with peace, freedom and justice for all. May we act with wisdom and fairness, compassion and courage and lead us on the path that provides the best for our children and our children's children. Father God, you have called us to be living stones and so we pray for your church throughout the world for all those who suffer persecution for their faith, their skin colour and their sexuality. We pray for the Methodist Church in Britain and across the High Wycombe Circuit. We pray for unity in our rich and wonderful diversity that we may live and love together in community with each other and with you and love our contradictory convictions. We pray for our new president of conference, Sonia Hicks, and vice president, Barbara Easton, and for all the decisions of the Methodist Conference that they may prayerfully strengthen us and lead to revival in our churches and be a sign to the nation of your caring love and concern. We pray for our circuit. We pray for our leadership team as we head towards a new Methodist year and the opportunities it brings. We pray for the churches in our circuit, for the churches of Marlow and the class of Stoken Church, for Flackwell Heath and for Downley as they explore exciting visions of the future, for Cries Hill and Tyler's Green as they mourn the loss of much-loved leaders. For Marla Bottom as it continues to develop an ecumenical partnership with Anglican sisters and brothers. And for the Avenue, Homer Green and Wesley as they continue to explore God's calling to them. Mother God, we pray for all those who we know are unwell at this time those awaiting tests, those suffering the effects of isolation, those grieving. Pray particularly for the family of Peter Stevens, a great servant to this circuit. And also for our brothers and sisters at Tyler's Green as they mourn a much loved friend and leader. We pray also for Jenny Lewis, one of Marla Bottom's stewards, rushed into hospital last Friday night. We pray for healing and for peace. And in a time of silence, we bring to you those prayers unspoken on our lips this morning, but that you know in our hearts. God of all eternity, ignite in us, your people, the faith to believe that you will one day heal our broken world 
and grow in us the perseverance to keep praying and working towards that day when your creation will once again be whole and free. We ask all these things in and through the matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'm going to share the prayer that Jesus taught us, but this time I'd like you to listen. Listen to the prayer that Jesus taught us. Listen to the responses that Leslie will share and dwell and pray on those words of that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, who is at home in the air, soil, forests and oceans, hallowed be your name, by the care we take of your creation. Your kingdom come. May all that you see be good. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is your will for us that we till and we care. Give us this day our daily bread. That all may have sufficient to live life in all its fullness. Forgive us our trespasses, our greed, our exploitation, our lack of concern for other species and for future generations. As we forgive those who trespass against us. By reconciliation with your justice and peace. Lead us not into temptation. The temptation to want more than we need. And deliver us from evil the evil of destroying your gift of creation. For yours is the kingdom. It is yours, Lord, not ours. The power and the glory. In your cross and resurrection. For ever and ever. You are the beginning and you are the end. Amen. So be it. Thank you. So we come to our final hymn uh, for our service today. Um, you'll see just two verses on your service sheets for Love Divine. Um, the middle, there are two others, so do join in those if you know the words. Otherwise, we'll just listen, but we'll sing with gusto the first and last verses. Love Divine, all love's excelling.
dodgiest slim pickings in here tonight, Sally. Not much there at all. Oh, oh, here, yeah, yeah, straighten up, Harry. We've got visitors. Yeah, evening, your lordship. Oh, uh, evening. Uh, Reverend John Wesley at your service. Oh, man, a proper man of the cloth. <laughs> is, uh, is something ailing you, your reverendship? No, no, no. I, I, I'm not sick. I'm just merely overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, I've just been to a prayer meeting here in Aldersgate. And we barely got started when suddenly the Holy Spirit came and lifted me up. Lifted you up? Uh, did, did the Holy Spirit happen to fill you up with any food by any chance? Quiet, Harry. Tell us, tell us more about this Holy Spirit filling you up. Well, there I was. And somebody was reading the preface to the Romans. You know, that letter that says... The whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until the present time. And the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and brought into the same glorious freedom as the children of God. Believe me, Mr. Wesley, I know all about groaning in childbirth. Look, I, I, I'm sure, but this isn't human pregnancy. It's about the creator God who gives birth to everything and giving birth again to a new and unsullied creation. Now that does sound painful. But then, but then something else happened. What, you fell asleep? No, no. I felt my heart strangely warmed. Yeah. Harry, I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation and assurance that was given me that had taken away my sins, even mine, had saved me from the law of sin and death. Oh, sir, how nice to have everything you've ever done wrong taken away, just like that. Now that's real freedom. I never got freedom when I transgressed. I just got banged up in prison. Well, Harry, don't you want to experience the real freedom instead? Freedom from living on these grimy London streets. Freedom in a new creation where all things, including you, are made again. Oh, I do, sir. I want that freedom. Well, Sally, and Harry, this long-promised new creation doesn't start here. It starts in here. It starts in the heart and reaches out to transform the whole world. Oh, not the likes of us, sir. Sally, it's there for you and for everyone. Even me as well, sir. Even you as well, Harry. Look, come to dinner. I'm starting a movement for Christians who want to be part of this new creation. Spiritual people who want to transform themselves and help transform the world. Oh, oh thank you, sir. I, I, I will willingly come for the food. But, but how does someone like me help transform the world? <laughs> well, it just so happens. I've been working on a method for my new movement. Oh, if you don't mind me saying, it all sounds very, um, very methodical, Mr. Wesley. Oh, that's given me an idea. <laughs> Off together. Fine. And so we come to the end of our service. It's been a full service, but I hope a, a very meaningful 